Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Zile from the Levin College and the director of the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management here. And I want to say thank you for uh, coming to our second uh, Meet the Mentor panel discussion. I'm really excited today to uh, be able to continue to continue the conversation and expand this part of our portfolio. Um, obviously, we are still in this COVID pandemic, but the uh, pandemic has allowed us to um, zoom the world now into the program. And Alexandra and the rest of our team did a wonderful job of expanding the Meet the Mentor uh, portfolio. Uh, so this year we added a lot of extra panels to to uh, showcase the, the the actual mentors, but also we one of our strategies this year was to to find ways to collaborate more with our academic programs and uh, and our faculty. And I'm just thrilled for today to launch the second panel, but to also um, find a way to connect the dots between our panelists our faculty and our programs. And today we're gonna to feature our, our, planning, our planning department through uh, Dean um, Ganning, but also our, our planning program and our four panelists for today. So uh, on behalf of the, the college and the university, I wanna thank everyone for coming. I wanna thank our panelists again for helping us out with our students this year and uh, Dean Ganning for moderating today's event. Before I pass it over to back to Alexandra for the next step. I do want to say that there, I'm really tickled about today because it's really following our 3C process. And um, for me, what the three C's means is our coursework, our competencies, and our connections. And I think today's dialogue and discussion and conversation we're going to have are really going to hit on all three of those. So for our students out there, please uh, Pay attention to the conversation. Feel free to join us in the conversations with the Q&A section. And on, on behalf of the students that have already submitted questions, I wanted to thank you for your active participation and forwarding some really good content to keep things going. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton back to Alexandra Higgle. And uh, thanks again for everyone for coming and for all your help. Have a great conversation. All right, well, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, all. Welcome to our second Meet the Mentors panel discussion. And we are thrilled to be joined by four dynamic panelists, as well as a fantastic moderator. But before we begin, I do have a few announcements. So first of all, please note that we do have two more panels in our Meet the Mentor series. So our next panel, Meet the Nonprofit Management Mentors, will be held on Wednesday. Wednesday, January 27th, and will be moderated by Professor Jeff Bowen. So stay tuned for more info. Secondly, like the last panel, we are welcoming audience Q&A. So we encourage you to chat your questions in the designated Q&A box at any time during today's panel. Also, please note that today's session is being recorded and it will be posted on the college's YouTube page. And finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Joanna Ganning. Dr. Joanna Ganning is Associate Dean of Faculty Research, Development, and Administration in the Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. She's an Associate Professor of Economic Development and the Program Director of the Master of Urban Planning and Development Program. She serves as co-chair of the economic development track of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. She holds a PhD in regional planning and studies the economic development processes of places marginalized by geography or socioeconomic status with the goal of raising the standard of living for everyone. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Ganning. Thank you, Alexandra, for the introduction, and thank you to Director Zile for having me here today um, to moderate this panel. I am so excited to share this time with the dynamic panel of, um, of mentors that we've put together for this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce them, and then we'll get into the questions. Joan Chase is a manager at Allegro Real Estate Brokers and Advisors. 
She focuses on providing strategic advisory services to Allegro's government, nonprofit, and corporate clients. Deliverables include economic development strategy, land use planning, market feasibility, fiscal impact analysis, site selection, land assembly, government approvals, and regulatory requirements. She has a BA in economics and a master of science in urban studies with a concentration in economic development from the Living College of Urban Affairs. Thank you, Joan, for being here. Arthur Schmidt is a project manager with OHM Advisors, a community advancement firm, which is a diverse mission-driven team working collaboratively across multiple services and sectors. Arthur's eight years of experience include community and transportation planning, public policy, zoning codes, economic development, and public participation. Prior to OHM Advisors, Arthur worked as a streetscape and transportation planner for the City of Cleveland Planning. In addition to his role with OHM Advisors, Arthur serves as Vice Director of the APA Ohio Cleveland Chapter, where a lot of us interact with him. He holds a master's degree in urban planning, design, and development from Cleveland State, a master's degree in urban design from Kent State, and a bachelor's in architectural studies also from Kent State. Arthur, it's always good to see you. Jeff, I'll just say Jeff Sugalski has played a role in the redevelopment of Cleveland's Kinsmen and Central neighborhoods for over 15 years. He's served in various real estate development positions with Burton Bell Car Development from interim to director. His accomplishments since becoming real estate development director in 2014 include co-writing and copy editing the agency's much lauded community-driven master plan, leading efforts to develop more than $12 million in project managing the development of 48 new affordable houses, managing the acquisition of over 100 properties in key development areas, and garnering over $350,000 to support health and safety repairs for low-income homeowners. Jeffrey has a dual graduate of the Levin College, earning his BA in Urban Studies and Master of Urban Planning, Design, and Development with a Housing and Neighborhood Development concentration. He lives in Cleveland's Detroit Shoreway neighborhood with his wife, Andy, also a Levin College grad, and their two young children. And finally, Elise Eblonsky has a passion for great urban places. She currently serves as the planning director for University Circle Inc., the community service corporation responsible for developing, serving, and advocating for University Circle and the vibrant and complete neighborhoods. In her role, she's led projects that preserve and celebrate history, activate and enhance public space, make streets safer places for all, and give new life to underutilized properties in University Circle, which I know we can all get behind. Previously, she's worked in destination development at Destination Cleveland and on city changing urban park projects with the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation. Yablonski holds master's degree from public policy and management and city and regional planning from The Ohio State University. She completed her undergraduate studies at Mercyhurst. A Cleveland native, she's now raising her family in the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood. So Jeff and Elise, both of you as well, it's great to have you here. With that, I am going to segue over to our um, questions for this evening. If all of the panelists can, can join me here, we'll get started. I'm gonna start with an intro question, a bit of an icebreaker to warm up. And anyone who'd like to take the lead here, please feel free. The introduction question is about your current role. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Planning and economic development can often seem vague or unclear to people who haven't spent time in them. So what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And how has your professional and academic background gotten you there? Who would like to jump in? Joan, how about you? Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my boss and I call the consulting department at Allegro the weird real estate stuff department. So if it's anything that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a transaction, it's not buying something, it's not selling something, uh, it's not leasing something, then it falls into consulting. Um, and that really ranges. So it could be, we do huge projects, we do really small projects. Um, so I'm trying to quick do a quick rundown. So in the recent years, um, I'm trying to think, we've done, one of the projects that I'm most pleased with is Urban Community, which is a tiny little um, 
school on the near west side that serves really low income children, I think in a really special way. Um, they decided to bring Metro Health onto their campus. And we helped uh, to bring the clinic to help better serve their children and their student population. And we helped structure that lease so that it worked for Metro Health, who has very specific guidelines as a county entity about the leases they enter into. Um, and then also it throws off a great return for Metro Health. So that's a really fun sort of small project we've worked on. Um, and in the past year, I um, helped get an incentive package for uh, an advanced manufacturer uh, who's building an $80 million plant um, to do really interesting proprietary um, manufacturing. So really talking about the really small projects and the really, really big ones. Um, and my, the path that I served, the skills that really helped me to get here is I think always saying, sure, when someone asks you to do something with the mindset of, eh, we'll figure it out how to do that later, future, us, we'll figure that out. Um, so say yes and figure it out as you go. Um, and just that willingness to pitch in has been really helpful to me. Terrific, I love that. Who else would like to go? Sure, I'll jump right in. Um, so I, um, I landed in urban planning and development, I, I think because I had a lifelong interest in, um, in just cities and different environments. I, I distinctly remember when I was a kid, um, I grew up in the city of Brooklyn, Ohio, and my dad would take me to go get his weekly bus passes at Rite Aid on Fulton in Old Brooklyn. And I just remember that um, once we passed over the imaginary boundary, uh, the city looked a little bit differently than where I was used to and where I grew up. Um, things were a little bit older. The housing style were differently different. Um, people looked different and were more diverse. So I just had this lifelong infatuation with why, why is it that you can go two miles and things look completely different uh, in, in the same region? So that kind of um, pushed me to study more geography. And I didn't know there was an urban planning field until I took a, a intro to urban studies class at Tri-C. And I was just really blown away. I had a really good and inspirational professor who um, knew that I was really uh, interested in this field and spent the time with me and told me all about the Levin College. So I, I did my undergrad and my master's at Levin College. I just loved it so much. I just kept going. And I also had um, pretty valuable experiences there. I was a GA with the Center for Neighborhood Development um, for a couple of years where I worked on the Neighborhood Link website. And uh, I had some other internship opportunities that just kept building on top of each other. But um, in terms of how I would describe my, my position, um, one of my colleagues, she describes herself as an affordable housing developer as a cat herder, professional cat herder, and that we're just trying to pull together people of different disciplines to work on a major project together, even though we're complete generalists and we know a little bit about everything it's you really rely on the expertise of all sorts of different professionals lawyers architects engineers um you just rely on them so much so as a professional cat herder you basically know what each each teammate plays in the role but you got to make sure that they're doing what they need to do um other than that i would describe myself as a, a supervisor I'm also a, a planner. I've done planning. I've done development. I'm an administrator, a grant writer, and um, sort of like the gatekeeper to the neighborhood when it comes to land use and, and development is um, really vetting different proposals that come across our desk and trying to determine if they're a good fit for the neighborhood or not. If they have, um, if they meet the needs of the neighborhood, if people had the opportunity to, to give their involvement, their input and their involvement because um, people embrace what they help create. So um, do, we do a little bit of, of that stuff, but basically everything related to um, physical development I've done at Burton Bell Carr. Thank you so much. That was such an articulate explanation of why we offer 
a generalist planning approach in the method program, but students can also choose if they like a specialization, but it's not mandatory because a generalist planning degree is incredibly valuable for the jobs such as you've described. So thank you for that. Um, Arthur, how about you? Yes, um, so thank you. So um, uh, taking kind of, I guess, the approach uh, that Jeff talked about, you know, I kind of came into uh, urban planning and design. Um, I, my interest started at a really young age. I was always interested in architecture. Um, as my parents will tell you, I played a lot with Legos and waffle blocks. Um, and uh, my love of, of sports also curtailed into that because uh, as my parents affectionately have told me, uh, they took me um, to uh, Jacob's Field and I said to them that I want to be the person who designs that. Um, and so since then, uh, my love for architecture grew. Um, and then I, I kind of came into the realm of, of urban planning and design in, in a similar way, as Jeff mentioned, of just a fa an infatuation and an interest in, in, in the city, in the built form, uh, in the elements uh, that, that grew out of, of these cities and the elements that are a part of it. And uh, while I was in architecture school for my undergrad, uh, began to become more um, uh, aware of, of the profession, uh, of that track and understanding that built form. Um, and so uh, through my studies with uh, both Cleveland State and Kent State had that opportunity to uh, uh, enhance my skill set uh, a little bit more and, and understand that built form. Um, as those of you, as those individuals who know me very well, um, I, I love to talk and interact with folks. So the social aspect of, of urban planning and design and being able to interact with members of, of the community or with uh, political individuals or just, just stakeholders in general and coming together to build uh, a plan to me uh, is, is really inspiring and it's what drives me every day uh, to do what I do. Um, in, in kind of breaking down kind of uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, tasks, um, you know, as, as Jeff was talking about being a cat herder, uh, I think in, in my role with OHM, I, I see my role as, as kind of uh, building, uh, to use a sports reference, I guess, kind of building a playbook, uh, working with different communities and working with different um, individuals to kind of build a playbook um, that can be uh, executed uh, at various levels. Um, so what are the different pieces and parts that we can bring to the table? Uh, what do uh, those spaces uh, and those areas look like? Again, listening to ind individuals, gaining perspective, trying to interweave that uh, with uh, the, the ultimate goal. Um, I always see my role as, you know, how can I take my skill set uh, that I've learned and that I've developed over the years, listen to members of the community, listen to stakeholders, and then bring that all together uh, in, in a document, in a playbook that can then eventually be uh, executed. Um, so in my day-to-day -day role, it's a combination of, of managing different projects that we have going right now. Um, it's working on those projects, so being a doer as well, developing those ideas, working with stakeholders, working with uh, community members, so on and so forth. Um, and then it's also looking for opportunities for those plans that we have worked on uh, that can be executed, um, whether it's through grant writing, whether it's through um, uh, different funding sources uh, that are available uh, to really make sure that the, the old adage that I think a lot of planners talk about, you know, the plan doesn't sit on the shelf, right, to make sure that that plan does not sit on the shelf. Because I think as, uh, as anyone who has written and worked very hard uh, on a plan and on a document, I think the last thing anybody wants to do is see that sit on the shelf and not come to fruition. Um, because there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of tears sometimes that goes into those uh, documents. Um, and those documents are really reflective of what um, that individual area, that community, that space, that neighborhood is at the moment, but then also what it wants to be um, in the future. So um, that's what kind of uh, drives me and, and that's what uh, the kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, life, even in this COVID era, kind of looks like right now. Thank you. What a, um, a rich answer. And Elise, um, you're the, the last of our introductions here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thanks to my fellow panelists, such, such great answers. And I relate to a lot of them, particularly the cat herder <laughs> um, description. But um, similar to Jeff, I grew up, um, I actually grew up in the city of Cleveland. And so my passion for urban places came from a place of loving my community and um, seeing that it was different and that it had different challenges. And so that's always been a driving, a driver for me. While I didn't always know the role, exact role I wanted, I knew I always wanted to work in urban communities. Um, and I also always knew I wanted to um, advance the public good. 
with my with my degree. So I had those general drivers as I was uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. I also wasn't aware until later of planning as a field. I found it through looking into um, actually MPA programs. And so Ohio State had a dual program of the two and that's how I found planning. Um, in terms of my day to day, uh, again, similar to Jeff, I'm fortunate that I get to work on such a, a wide range of projects from transportation to early site planning. Um, to uh, park space improvement, historic preservation. A lot of times we are uh, the first interface someone might have with the neighborhood or the interface, um, particularly working in University Circle where we have such a dense concentration of institutions, over 40 of them. Um, the interface for some of our institutions when they need to go beyond their walls to work with uh, partners, to work with the city, um, to be a convener, a connector, um, and there's also a significant amount of just being out in the neighborhood and kind of auditing for both opportunities and threats. Where are the opportunities that we have to activate? Where might we need to make an intervention to make something work better in the neighborhood to be um, responsive to comments that we get from stakeholders and from the public? So I've always really enjoyed that about my, um, my role, that it is different every single day, month to month, year to year. Um, and in terms of kind of skills, I think, you know, um, you've heard from the other panelists, a lot of soft skills mentioned. One of my favorite things to say to students, because I also hated them so much at the time, um, is that one of the best practice opportunities are group projects, <laughs> because in your, in your work, you do not control others, <laughs> and you all ultimately have to work together to get something done. And so as much as I, I bemoan them at the time, group projects are really great opportunities to kind of practice those soft skills and, and learn to work towards a common goal. Elise, I might ask you to come and speak to a class sometime to promote that uh, philosophy. It is sometimes a tough sell. It is so clear that you're all very passionate about urban space and place and community engagement and the work that you do. And so it's, it's not uh, surprising, I suppose, that you would want to, you, you might have an interest in sharing that passion with others and in helping to bring others along that path who are, who are new to the field and who are trying to find their way. But I'd like to ask you, and I'm going to start with Beth and then Joan here, about, about more detail on that of why mentoring is important to you and how long have you been doing that? Sure, so this is my second year mentoring um, through the Levin College, but I've always wanted to do it. I, when I was in grad school, I had a mentor too that really helped make some connections, um, gave me a lot of advice on, on my um, career direction. Uh, he was a real estate developer. And um, one of the things that he did that I'm sort of forever grateful for was to connect me with um, Detroit Shoreway Development. And um, I did a like a three week externship um, on, in the housing development office. And I just continued to build on that experience. Um, so that experience helped me get an internship with Burton Bell Carr, which allowed me to kind of show my work to the organization that when a full time position came available, they said, Jeff, we want you to work here. So um, as a mentor, that's how it has benefited me, or, or a mentee, I should say. As a mentor, um, it's, I, it's just fun. I just enjoy it a lot. I've been seeking to do it for a long time. Um, I want to give back. I want folks to not have to experience learning curves like me um, in, in my career. I want to make it easier for, for young folks. And um, uh, I just really enjoy the experience in, in helping people fulfill their needs and uh, coming up with creative approaches to, um, to connect people or to educate people. So I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's just fun. And I feel like I have made a difference in, in the uh, lives of my mentees. So great, thanks Jeff. Um, so this is my first year being a mentee, mentor, and I've really been enjoyed it. And I echo a lot of what Jeff said. I think that um, when I was in grad school, uh, 
the former Dean Ned Hill was a mentor of mine and hugely helpful and impactful in me getting my first job out of grad school, which I was very grateful for um, during the Great Recession when things looked very scary, not dissimilar to how they look right now, I'm sure. Um, and also I think the other interesting piece around mentee and mentor um, that doesn't get discussed a lot is also that advocate. So a mentor is someone who will really help you work through big problems and you can go to whenever you're struggling, um, which I think is important. But I think to have a successful career, especially if you are a minority and if you're a woman, this is really important, um, that you have someone who's an advocate. And that's someone who's going to put you in the name, put you in the ring for big jobs. Um, and I was going to say that you should do something maybe before you're ready, um, who pushes for you to get promoted and have those pay increases. Um, so I really think as you're kind of laying out in your mind, at least, who those folks are for you, it's really helpful to have both. And I'll just add one more thing really quickly. Uh, the last few years, I've been thinking about having a mentor as well, even though I've been in the field for a long time. Um, I don't know if the other panelists do as well, but it's a huge help to just kind of talk to somebody about what you have going on professionally and get it, it's sort of like talk therapy for work in a way. And um, just to get somebody's perspectives that's been doing this work for a very long time, it's just completely invaluable. Yeah, that's a great point, Jeff, absolutely. And it pertains to the academic life as well. I'm gonna switch panelists here and ask the next question uh, directed to Arthur and Elise. Of course, Jeff and John, if you wanna weigh in, you're absolutely welcome to. But I'd like to ask you to speak about a pivotal moment you encountered in your career and did you have a mentor to guide you through that time? Yeah, I can, I can jump in here and it, it relates to something Joan ended with, this experience of graduating um, in the height of the Great Recession, which I did as well. <laughs> And one of those pivotal moments for me was the decision to, um, to take a job in Columbus at that point. Um, I, why it relates to the conversation is I was fortunate enough that people took time with me in Cleveland to talk to me about opportunities there and um, understood and listened to my desire to really want to be in Cleveland, which was so, so strong to the point that I almost didn't take a job. Um, but made me realize that I, I needed to have the bigger picture, that I needed to um, take the opportunities that existed, as long as they, that opportunity put me on a path towards what I wanted. And so help me think through and talk through whether that was the case, which, you know, um, ultimately was. I mean, sitting here now, I can't imagine that I would not have taken that job, but it was very much um, in my thoughts that I might just try to find something in Cleveland, even though I was hearing from everyone that there was just nothing right now. Um, and similarly, because the only reason I was even up for that job in Columbus was because of an internship opportunity I had had through Ohio State that I had made me aware of and connected to this opportunity. So, you know, your network is your lifeline <laughs> in your, um, as you're kind of creating your career. And the other thing I'll say, building off of what Joan said is, you know, um, I've been really fortunate that every single boss and what Jeff said, every single boss of mine has, has been a mentor and continues to be a mentor. So I, I am so grateful for that perspective of those that have more experience than I do, <laughs> that are willing to be a sounding board to offer guidance and to be an advocate in those times when, um, when we all need it, so. Yeah, and I think to, to build on that uh, as well, um, at least what you were talking about, you know, um, in thinking about the question about, you know, moments um, that I've encountered, you know, I, I started thinking of, of quite a few moments um, um, throughout my, uh, not only my career, but also life when it came to uh, being in high school and deciding which program uh, to go to uh, for undergraduate degree, uh, when it was in college um, and deciding whether or not it made sense to go to grad school or it made more sense to start looking for a job right after, um, you know, having those individuals um, who, who I still keep in contact uh, with today to, to just, I, I think as both uh, Elise, Jeff and, and Joan had pointed out, just having an individual to talk to um, who has gone through that experience and who can give some insight uh, and just offer some perspective um, uh, for you. Um, within my career itself, I, I know that there was a, a couple of times, uh, both uh, due to a, a, a situation at work, um, you know, some 
something that came up with a project or um, there was even an instance of like an ethical situation where I was able to go uh, to a, a mentor of mine and just ask the question of, you know, this is the situation, you know, here, here are the facts of the situation, what are your thoughts? Um, and, um, and also a time of just when I was deciding whether or not I wanted to, to, to make a, a career change or, or a move within my profession, uh, which was, which was a, uh, not an easy move. Um, you know, sometimes people see it from the outside and it's like, I, I think you, at least you mentioned it, right? Looking back at Columbus of like, well, of course you're going to take that position. But in the moment at the time, you know, there's, there's so many different things going on. Um, there's, there's different, you know, life things outside of your career. So you're trying to think of your, you know, your life, you're trying to think of your career advancement um, and, and the situation. So it's very helpful. And I think, um, I guess to even piggyback on the, on the first question um, that, that you mentioned, Dr. Ganning, you know, in, my situation, I think what's really beneficial for uh, students here at CSU and, and what um, the college has done with this mentorship program, you know, the mentors that I've had um, are have not been through a formal setting, right? It's been, I think, as Elise and Joan have mentioned, it's been a colleague or it's been a superior, right? A boss, a director, um, it's been a, a teacher, it's been an individual who has just taken that liking to me, I guess, um, or had, had seen something and just decided to kind of step in and, and and play that role, right? So there wasn't that like official, like you are said mentee and you are said mentor, right? Um, so it was kind of organic, but um, I think what's great about this program though, is that you have kind of that that set stage for you, right? Because that is really helpful, you know, because it's, it's not easy. You have to have the right situation and maybe others can speak to it. You know, you have to have that right individual who's willing to do that, you know, and not everybody is fortunate enough to be in that situation where you have someone who is your boss uh, or you have someone who's around you who has more experience who's willing to take on you know that role um so that way again going going back to the first question you know having this opportunity being presented an opportunity to be a mentor in a formal setting and even an informal setting to me is invaluable because i saw the um the value it had for myself and how it helped me in making some decisions uh, and helping my career. And in my eyes, I just want to kind of pay it forward, right? Be, be that for that individual. Um, and, you know, again, to this day, there are the, the individuals I consider mentors, um, I still keep in, uh, in contact with, uh, we still connect uh, with one another at, at various points. It's not, you know, some of the relationships aren't, you know, I'm, I don't mean it to say like we're texting or talking every day, you know, sometimes every couple of months, but we still keep in connection. And it's nice to still be able to have those individuals to go back to. Absolutely. Anyone else want to weigh in on this question? If not, I'll, I think I'll oh, just say ahead. really quickly that um, when I was younger, I I had the mindset that um, that people were too busy for me, and I think now I, I learned that it's completely the opposite. People are busy, but it's so easy. Most people in this field will meet with you if you reach out to them. And if they don't, if they don't respond to your email or your call, that's okay, don't, don't worry about it. Just move on because they might be busy. It may, it's nothing personal in all likelihood, but it took me at least like 10 years to figure out that it's, Cleveland is so small, it's so easy to connect with folks. Um, I just want everybody to have that mindset, like just make connections and see where it, it lands. And, you know, it can only be good for you. And as a college, we're honored to get to play a part in that and making those connections for people. You've all spoken about how you got to where you are and the roles that individuals played in that journey for you. So I see a segue here to a question we've gotten from one of the mentees that's on the line from Anton Krieger, who asks, do you find that planners most often come from an educational background of planning, or do you see people with public administration or nonprofit backgrounds as well? I would say uh, there are all sorts of people that do this work that have all kinds of crazy backgrounds in planning and development. Um, I'm looking at resumes for a position right now, and um, I have an engineer that doesn't have any planning experience, but has a lot of project management experience. Uh, I have people who do have development experience, but it, in my experience, um, the internships and volunteer opportunities 
and um, student projects help you chart the, the path that you want to go down. Um, you don't have to be, if you're going for an entry level job in real estate development or planning, you don't have to have a ton of experience, but you do have to show that you do have a, a foundation that you can build upon um, regardless of what your educational background is. Just to add, oh, oh, good, Arthur. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think um, this is going to be a, a little bit of a, a scary moment for me personally, because I'm going to sound like my father. Um, it's, it's coming to that point now in life. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, he would say to me is like, you know, kind of like, what's the end goal, right? Like, where, where is it that you want to see yourself and where you want to be and kind of work a little bit backwards from there, right? So I think to the question of, of kind of the educational background, I guess the question I would you know, kind of spin back to that individual is, you know, where would you like to see yourself? Like, what type of organization would you like to be a part of? What is the type of work you would like to do? And, and then begin to kind of work back from there. And the reason I say that is because I think, I think those of us who are in the field right now are, you know, this is an evolving field. You know, I, I remember, again, in, in undergrad, that this was still a very newish field in the term of having kind of uh, formalized positions uh, for it, at least that was kind of indicated, you know, to me, um, because it was a lot of times individuals in quote unquote other fields that were doing this kind of planning work. Um, so I think, you know, to Jeff's point, there are a lot of individuals who have a variety of backgrounds. I know through my career and experience, you know, no one has had kind of like the same path, right? Um, as opposed to, you know, maybe other professions where there's kind of a quote unquote structured path that you're you're heading down. Um, and so I think relating to that, I think figuring out what that end goal is, where, where do you want to see yourself, uh, the type of organization and the type of work, and then being able to identify, answer that question, identify that, and then kind of working backwards. Uh, and again, speaking to, speaking to those organizations and finding out, you know, what are uh, some of the qualifications, because I'm sure, you know, the four of us here uh, on the panel, um, you know, we've had uh, kind of varying no, but maybe similar um, educational uh, backgrounds, but the work we do is a little bit different from one another. And, you know, how individuals uh, are part of that organization is also very different uh, from, from one another. So um, that would be, that would be my fatherly two cents advice that I'm passing down. <laughs> uh, so I just, I feel like in a couple of ways, I'm like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a planner. I'm an MSUS grad, um, and I'm also like the only, I'm the lone, I was like, business, dark side, come work for corporate, it's great, um, benefits are lovely, uh, so I should make that plug. Uh, but I do think, just to counterpoint a little bit what Arthur is saying, I wouldn't worry too much right now about your academic qualifications. Like, yes, get the qualification, um, that's important. But I'm going to actually shout out to Jessica Columbi, who is the Director of Career Services at Cleveland State. Um, skills, skills are what are so important. So, and don't, you don't need to have all of them right now. If you came out of your educational background with all the skills that you're going to have for the rest of your career, that would be a very sad outcome. And that's simply not the case. So get into that first job, see if you like it, kind of feel it out. Think about the skills you want to develop um, and you'll go from there. Just stay curious and it will, it will work out. Don't put too much pressure on yourself right now to have all the exact right everything it's going to be your career something that grows and in higher education in pursuit of those skills also cultivate that passion for learning to carry with you as one of those tools this is a great segue uh, joan i think you know where i'm going here because i'd like to pitch it right back to you to ask you about that skill set that uh, our mentees should aim to develop while they are still in school right um, so thanks so much so I have a very strong opinion on this. Um, I think you should look to develop the most challenging skills you can. So I know a lot of people talk about soft skills and soft skills are important. But when I talk about how hard skills are what get you noticed on a resume. So those are things like, can you run a financial model? Can you do really deep technical stuff? Um, Dr. Ganning was mentioning before this call, can you do deep kind of slice and dice data from census and BLS and crosswalk it and be able to understand what the data is telling you at the end of the day. Because um, I firmly believe like a hard skill is going to 
get you much more likely to get hired. You know, you're going to get that interview, but also more importantly, you get paid more in jobs when you can do things that other people can't. Um, so I think that's a really important deciding mechanism as you're looking through, you know, should I take one class versus another? Should I learn this thing? Um, you ask yourself, is this a hard thing that fewer people can do? Great. Take it, learn it, master it. And to add, uh, I wanted to address the soft skills because a lot of times those are kind of like critical skills when I'm hiring somebody or bringing someone on board. Um, I, I definitely look at those. And those are things like writing, speaking and listening. Um, a huge one for me is cultural competency and ability to work with people of different uh, backgrounds, diverse backgrounds. Um, and I know for my, you know, working in the poorest neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods in Ohio, uh, in a being a white person in an all black neighborhood, it's, it's a challenge. But at the same time, we have to have people who come in and are comfortable and treat people just the same as anyone else. So those are really important skills. And you'd be surprised how many people do, do not have those skills um, or have not fully developed those skills. But um, community engagement, being able to talk to a group and, and, um, and know the right questions asked to get people to do the actual planning themselves. Um, creativity, passion is really important. Problem solving ability, organization, confidence is a huge one. And also um, the, the ability to comprehend things very quickly, um, co especially complicated things. But yeah, I agree with Joan, the creating a, a budget, putting together a budget and um, working with those numbers, uh, task management or project management is huge, uh, but it really depends on what position you're coming into. So if I can add, I'm, I'm gonna play the, the middle role between Joan and Jeff with, with your comments in, in the sense that, you know, Joan, I think to your point, you know, the hard skills, I think learning those, especially in school, um, looking back on it, I think can be more beneficial uh, to, to that individual student um, as they're looking for uh, their career, um, but it's also more attainable because um, I think I've noticed that being in the field, um, you're not so much learning new hard skills or learning new techniques. Um, you're like honing those techniques that you already have or learning maybe some new ways uh, to do it. Um, so I guess I'm looking at it too from a design perspective with kind of my uh, architecture background of you know, utilizing different programs, whether it's Adobe based programs, AutoCAD, MicroStation, um, or, um, you know, SketchUp or things like that. But like learning those programs or having some some idea of, of how to utilize those programs, um, I think it's easier to uh, work on in school um, uh, while you're educating yourself, because when you get into the field, you're kind of honing those skills. You don't have as much time to really hone those skill set uh, while you're working on a project because you need to be uh, you have to have a certain level of efficiency uh, on that project. Um, whereas I think some, not all, but some of the soft skills that like Jeff, you were, you were listing out, some of those you can begin to develop as you get into the field because you begin to learn more, right? I know that, you know, my time working um, at the city of Cleveland's uh, planning department, you know, I, I kind of went in, you know, of course thinking like, oh yeah, I got this, I can do that. I, you know, I, I, I know how to do this. And then you go into the community and that's where kind of like reality hits you a little bit and you realize, oh, okay, you know, the next time I need to approach this conversation this way, or maybe this might be in a more effective way to, um, you know, do this type of engagement or interact with these sort of the, this group of individuals or uh, that type of individual, so on and so forth. And, and even to this day, I feel like I'm still learning that. And maybe some of us are relearning that uh, as we're trying to get used to this kind of temporary Zoom uh, virtual, all, all virtual platform, right? Um, so uh, I guess to play the middle ground of, you know, utilizing your time in school to uh, develop those hard skills um, because it's, it, it's, it's better suited, I feel like, in that sense. And one more about the sort of the, the accrediting or the skill building here, and then we'll switch gears a bit, but what about the AICP? Uh, is it is it a worthwhile certification to pursue? What is your perspective on it? Um, so, so with the AICP, I, you know, it it really does begin to demonstrate uh, an individual's expertise um, because you are 
uh, it's it's a it's a nationwide um, exam administered by the American Planning Association. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a verification of of planners' qualifications. It you know it oversees kind of the plan making process. Um, talks about the history uh, and the legal aspect uh, of planning. Um, I think the biggest aspect of it is begins to show your commitment to to the ethics um, and to to the overall code of ethics uh, that we um, as planners have. Um, so I definitely think it's important, but I think even just as important um, as as potentially sitting for the exam, I think is is being involved. Um, you know, whether that's being involved uh, with APA, uh, whether that's at the national level, the state level, or shameless plug the local level uh, with APA Cleveland. Um, you know, I think being involved with other planners uh, really helps you to develop yourself. It's it's another kind of I guess mentoring program. Um, and even to expand that more, uh, and maybe Joan can can talk on this too from from her perspective. I mean, I think every profession has a professional organization that you can be part of, and I think the benefits of being part of that professional organization is you have another set of individuals uh, who are to a certain degree like minded, but in the same profession uh, that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can talk to, uh, that you can problem solve with. Um, so I think. Um, the, the AICP is is a great step for individuals who who want to take that step uh, for that accreditation. But I think just as important, maybe even a little bit more important, is being involved in your professional organization. Um, you know, for for planners, it's it's the American Planning Association. Um, I'm I'm going to be I'm ignorant on the other associations. Maybe Joan can talk about uh, uh, some of the other associations. But I think it's just important to be part of that, just for that um, uh, other kind of bonding aspect. Joan, did you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, I tend to think I am, um, certainly there's lots of great in real estate. There's tons of really great uh, professional organizations as well. There's ULI, there's NAOP. Um, so again, I think it matters less on the specific organization that you're involved in, but to uh, follow up with Arthur is yes, it's just important to be involved. Uh, get to know your peers, have those groups of folks. Um, there's always that great ability when you do a lot of that, that and Cleveland's a very small town. You end up working with folks a lot. You can kind of pick up the phone and aside from you go, do you understand what's going on here? Which is always a really, and the answer is sometimes they'll be like, no, oh, okay, good, good. Um, but it's just nice to have those folks who you can have very honest conversations with and get quick feedback um, and kind of short circuit uh, some of the bureaucracy sometimes. To take a related question from the audience, Stephanie Sheely asks, what roles or opportunities are available for students interested in economic and community development, but who are not planning to get a planning degree? And I think this is related because Arthur is talking about the socialization or the culturalization, I think that's a word, of planners with planning. Uh, this is a discipline, it's also a network of people. It is a group that you, you find mentoring in, you find friendship in, you find professional support when you have that what is happening moment, you find your people. And so this question relates to that, I think, of a student saying, I want this end goal career being part of this community, but I'm in a program right now that is not uh, aligned with that. So are there opportunities out there that will help me to take those steps? I'm happy so, to speak to, oh, go ahead. Jeff, you go. Okay, I'll give you a break, Joan. Um, I would say, um opportunities so it's i'm going to answer this two ways one is that you can gain a lot of good information by attending public meetings a lot are online now um, and also that helps because it's really easy or at least pre-covid it was really easy to walk up to a planner and say hey i really like this concept that you presented tonight is there a chance that I could sit down with you and, and learn more or figure out a way to become involved with the project? Like that's, that's one way uh, of doing that. Um, another way, I've, I've done it myself uh, and it, it's really worked effectively for me, but I created sort of like different volunteer opportunities uh, for myself to build on my, or to supplement my career experience. So 
Um, initially, I was working with uh, some different nonprofits back in the mid 2000s to develop websites um, when websites were still kind of new. And um, it was just helping them get the presence online was like super helpful. And I was able to put something on my resume. And I actually graduated up to doing my own volunteer projects. So um, I uh, helped to found this project called Old Brooklyn Pedal for Prizes. It's like a little economic development project where people ride their bicycles to local businesses and get a card stamped. And we have a huge Chinese style raffle afterwards, but um, it's, it's a, like a way to get people on bikes and to see the neighborhood and also support local businesses. So when they need to buy a shovel or a cake, they know to come to the old Brooklyn neighborhood. So um, I've done things like that, like just create my own opportunities, find out where the needs are and um, just get people on board to help me out too and, and to be teammates with me. So don't, um, I mean, if there's a need that you see, you know, if there is a community that doesn't have food and you're really passionate about it, like, you know, maybe that's your project to create like a food pantry program using some existing space in the neighborhood. Or, um, you know, I would say don't hesitate to reach out to different people who work in the field. Um, and I volunteer myself and just um, talk to people about opportunities that might be available because a lot of times things are not promoted um, online or not widely promoted. And a lot of times um, you'll be able to say, hey, I got this great idea. I want to turn this project into a landmark. Um, and you go meet with Elise or Joan or Arthur, or myself, and kind of talk through it. We have had a lot of conversations in all likelihood, if it's in our neighborhood or if it's related to the work we do, we've had conversations with funders and partners about these things before where I could potentially say, like, hey, I got this really dynamic person who's really passionate about this project. Is there any, you know, I can go to a funder and say, is there any opportunity or even my executive director and say, can I bring somebody on as an intern for a little while? Um, so I'd say the networking is, is key. As much as I hated to do it back then, it's such a vital, vital piece of the puzzle in advancing your career. I'll just, I'll second all of what um, Jeff said. And, and the way I took the question was almost um, more so, to, you know, not having a planning degree, what positions are open to you? And I'll just share that, that my first career opportunity, although it was absolutely a planning role, they didn't think that it was. And they were more interested in my master's of public administration and uh, management degree for that role. You know, that's, just, I think, another great role where you're learning um, management, budgeting, um, kind of a combination of hard and soft skills where so many of those first roles are kind of more like project or program coordinator roles that I think, um, you know, that MPA degree really sets you up well from. So I, I would never let, um, you know, the degree that you have give you a, a moment's hesitation of just going ahead and applying for a job if it seems like something that's in your wheelhouse that you're interested in, that you're passionate about, um, you know, that will show in the interview. And um, yeah, so that, that's how I took the question. I'm not sure how, um, hopefully that was terrific advice from all of you. And the, the, these mentees are a lucky bunch of folks. This is really great. Um, so I want to switch gears here to asking mentors to help your mentees think about priorities within the context of work. And we have a couple of questions on this topic. And then we have some more time for audience questions, but we're in a very strange time right now. It is very 2020 out there. And one of the criticisms of sustainability in the literature on it is that thinking about sustainability is a privilege, that if you are concerned about livelihood in the day-to-day, -day, food on the table and lights on in your home in the day-to-day, -day, that it is not practical or realistic to think about sustainability as your goal in that moment. We are in very hard times right now as a culture. And I think this question um, is very, maybe more important now than it would have been a year ago to us. And, and that is, how do you prioritize or do you prioritize sustainable development in today's climate in the context of your work? And let's see, um, Elise, why don't we just put this right back to you and then uh, ask Joan to jump in. Sure. 
Yeah, I can absolutely um, come into this from a neighborhood perspective. One of the things um, that has been very strongly guiding our community development work is um, focusing on transit-oriented development, understanding that the way that we all commute uh, and transport has such a huge um, sustainable impact. So everything from um, really evaluating our pedestrian and cyclist network and making physical improvements to that network that make cycling and walking more um, attractive options for folks. Um, we've developed an entire website called You Go in the Circle, providing information to folks about their transportation alternatives and options, uh, in addition to programming that goes along with it, again, making multimodal uh, more attractive. Our entire focus on building housing in the circle is largely about allowing people to live where they work. And as a part of this, and what I don't think a lot of people think about when they think of University Circle, is we are proudly and firmly um, a mixed income district. We have large uh, public and affordable housing buildings in University Circle that have at times in the past come under threat to be converted to market and have strongly remained. We think that that's a critical part of our urban fabric in University Circle and have been looking increasingly at opportunities, although um, you know some of our more recent projects have been fully market about opportunities for mixed income in the same development um, with some of our um, upcoming developments. Uh, and then further are a partner in a program that provides um, actual dollars, housing incentives to allow people to live near work, whether that be um, renting and hopefully ultimately ownership, living in University Circle and our surrounding neighborhoods, given that we're such a job hub. Um, so for us, that's a really driving um, part of what we do and how we do it. Uh, the other piece I would just add there is that we've also been trying to um, look for opportunities to partner with the sewer district because they have a great program to fund green infrastructure as a part of projects that we've often used um, to create better public spaces, even in private developments, create spaces that have community utility um, and also um, kind of, you know, improve our um, urban stormwater condition. So um, those are some of the ways from a neighborhood perspective that we are, um, are working towards that answer. I think it, it's more important now um, it's as important now as it's ever been. Thanks, Elise. And um, I, one other thing I wanted to add to the neighborhood piece, I just read this today in, I think, the Wall Street Journal of all places. Um, the number one death in the United States related to climate change is actually a, resulting from heat waves. Um, so when we think about sustainability, I think it's also thinking about, yes, sustainable development is like, I think it's more important in our day to day life and death situations then maybe we anticipate. Um, I want to kind of pivot this question to the larger qu thinking about sustainable development in terms of you know, cities and um, the region and kind of economic development. Uh, when we think about sustainable development, I think that we also have to think about it in terms of is the individual development itself sustainable and viable in the long term. Um, we were talking about, and we had a prep session among the panelists this, this afternoon, um, it, it was really interesting during the, four, um, during the crisis that has erupted in real estate as a result of the pandemic. Um, the project that immediately was foreclosed upon and has been repossessed is Pinecrest, which is in an exurban location, right, right on 271. Um, but it got repossessed immediately. It just simply could not survive uh, the changes. So I think that when we think about sustainable development, yes, it's important for environmental change. Yes, it's important for um, our future, but also I think it's important in terms of return on our investment. Um, if you're looking at it from a financial perspective, is this a project that is sustainable in and of itself? Is it in a neighborhood that already exists? Um, and I think that some more calculations we need to be doing as we continue uh, to think about sustainability in a bigger picture. Uh, I want to add like a real life example that I'm working on. Um, I've been working on the last few years. Uh, I don't know if um, how many of you guys have heard of the Sideway Bridge, but it's an old metal sus suspension bridge between that connected Slavic Village and the Kinsman neighborhood. And in the 1960s, it was burned down during the race riots. The deck of the bridge was burned down um, by the folks on the Slavic Village side who were predominantly white to prevent 
the folks from um, folks from Kinsmen who are predominantly black from going to school in their in their neighborhood or coming to the neighborhood to access uh, shops and services. So um, underneath that is a really interesting track of land. Um, there's about 90 acres of land owned by RTA in the city of Cleveland, primarily, and by our organization. And this will be on the um, the intersection of the Future Opportunity Corridor that'll be open in late 2021 and Kinsman Road, um, one of the highest traveled roads in Cleveland. But um, we've been working to turn that area into a 90 acre metro park, along with the bridge being restored, um, which is vitally important because of, you know, Black Lives Matter and the equity. This is the time to do it now. Um, but the people in the neighborhood uh, a third of the people in the neighborhood don't have access to a car. Who, who in their right mind would hop on a bus with three kids to, for an hour to go to a metro park? You know, by the time the kids get there, they're going to want to go home. So a lot of people in our neighborhood have not really been to a metro park before. And um, just over the last six years, this idea has gotten so much steam. Um, you guys may know of Irish Town Bend in Ohio City on the Cuyahoga River. Uh, that'll be about a $20 million park um, in a neighborhood that has access to a lot of facilities. But in Kinsman, a lot of the kids in the neighborhood have not been to the lake or a metro park because of the transportation barrier or just because, you know, it's not a huge priority for folks in the neighborhood. So we want to bring a uh, nature reserve, large scale nature reserve for people to kind of get the outdoor access that we all enjoy, um, where we can walk or bike or hike, but also to, to have families in the neighborhood care about the environment and climate change. This is kind of like their learning lab to really understand why climate change is so important. So um, that is, that's one of my goals is to bring this project into fruition. And it's just super exciting um, having that as kind of like a comprehensive neighborhood development strategy. That's just terrific. I'm, um, I love hearing these planning stories. They always get me. Um, and man, what a great set of goals. So this next question was submitted by Margaret Mahoney, who is one of Jeff's mentees. And I think it relates here in terms of priorities in your day-to-day -day life. And you all have such a passion for sustainability of urban form and sustainability of development. And clearly that's a priority for you. So that maybe is part of the next question, maybe it isn't, but I'm gonna ask Arthur to start us off here. How do you decide what projects to work on? What are timelines like? Um, what's a project that's made you proud? Yeah, so uh, in my in my world, in the in the consulting world, um, you know, largely, you know, we're going after projects, right? We're responding to requests for proposals or requests for qualifications, um, or working with um, uh, individuals like uh, Elise, Jeff, and Joan to to work on developing a, a project. Um, you know, versus uh, my previous work with with the city, where we had a little bit more autonomy in terms of trying to create or, or start a project, uh, maybe from scratch. Um, but what the nice thing is in, in my role uh, and with OHM, and it's one of the things that attracted me to, to the company is that, you know, one of the first criteria um, internally when we are, uh, when we see a project uh, uh, is requesting proposals or requesting qualifications is we ask uh, internally, does anybody have a passion for this project? And if the answer is no, then, then we don't pursue the project. Um, so one of our key aspects is we want to make sure that we have someone who's passionate about the work uh, that's going to come forward, right? Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that the, that the passion is, is, is there uh, before we decide that's something we work on because you, as, as all of us can probably attest to, you pour a lot of yourself into, into these projects. Uh, you really do. Um, you know, sometimes beyond uh, the time, you know, during a regular workday, uh, it sometimes goes on beyond it. Um, and, you know, one of the projects that we're wrapping up right now um, that we're working on is uh, the Vision for the Valley project. Um, and that's been something um, from a personal level that I've definitely poured a lot of uh, time and energy and effort in, uh, maybe even beyond what uh, the technical books say I put my time and energy in because it, it's a passion of mine, right? It goes beyond, um, you know, when you get to a point where you can start working on a project and you're not like looking at the clock of like, okay, when am I gonna be done with this? Or when, when do I get to stop at that? 
um, I think it begins to tell say to you that you're really passionate about that work. Um, and to expand on, you know, the typical projects and and you know the timelines associated with them. You know, different projects have different timelines. Like I've experienced projects where it's a very short turnaround time, where it's you know two three months. Um, this vision for the Valley project has been a twelve plus month uh, process, right? Um, so there's varying degrees of timeline. It all depends on the type of project you're working on, um, and so um, it really just comes down to the type, who you're working with, who your client um, is, who who. Uh, who the project is ultimately for, uh, and then what the ultimate goals are, right? Um, so I think that's that's part of it. So uh, being able to work on, being able to decide that you can work on projects that you're passionate about, I think goes a long way. And I think it goes back to some of the other um, questions that we've had um, uh, as part of this panel group and, and thoughts for uh, the mentees to think about in terms of where you wanna go, right? You wanna work in, in a setting and with individuals who are passionate, about what they do, who care about what they do. Um, it just makes everything, it, it just helps make everything go a little bit better, right? So um, I think I would answer this, I, I would probably answer this question differently depending on the day, to tell you the truth. A lot of times I just have to put out fires and I have really no choice of what I work on. Um, just getting to deadlines or when people call and need things, you know, people from the community, Miss Jones uh, needs um, something taken care of, you know, you got to kind of get on that quickly, especially if they come from uh, important people. But um, in terms of, so being, being at Burton Bell Car for 15 years, I'm finally at a point where I can kind of figure out um, what the, uh, what the development projects that we work on are. Um, and it's interesting because it seems like every five years, we have like a generation of projects that we worked on. We're wrapping up the projects that we started in 2014 right now. So it's kind of like a point where we hit reset and we say what's feasible from a financial, uh, from a financial perspective or structural perspective, if it's uh, existing building, what can be funded, um, what, because the funders have different requirements. If you're looking at the state and the, the LIHTC program, Low Income Housing Tax Credit, they always have like, um, they give you points for proximity to a pharmacy or a healthcare organization or bus stop. So you really have to kind of look at that criteria and see what projects fit effectively um, from a community engagement perspective. Will the community support the project that you would like to work on. Um, in some neighborhoods, it's easier than others. Does it fulfill a need? And does it align with the comprehensive master plan for the neighborhood? Though that's how I figure out what development projects to pursue. So um, I'll add, similar to Jeff, there are, um, oftentimes that I don't have control over the projects <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm working on or programs that I'm working on. Um, but I think what's particularly important early in your career um, is to acknowledge that, um, you know, Joan kind of spoke to this earlier, to be a team player, to do what needs to get done. Um, and and th that'll take you far, but then to ask and look for those opportunities that if someone's working on something that you're interested in, to see how you can get involved, making sure that you still finish your other work that you were assigned to do, um, but to find the, the ways that you can get involved, make sure your other work gets done too. Um, it might take more work. I know, especially early in my career that, you know, it ended up taking more hours of my day, but those were the things I was really passionate about. And that's how I got to um, get opportunities to learn and expand my skills. That was just asking like asking is so important and it can feel like you're a burden you know jeff brought up earlier like cultivating that confidence to just ask for a connection ask to get involved um it can be really hard i don't want to diminish that because i felt that especially early on in my career but it's it's so important and i think you'll find most people are willing to make that connection to give that opportunity to share knowledge um and then you know just from a project um a project standpoint i think adaptability perseverance patience, again, not having that strong ego, <laughs> you know, that your way is the right way, being able to listen to others and, and accept new perspectives. Um, because oftentimes the projects that we're working on 
have incredibly large timelines, you know, um, in terms of, you know, a project that you're proud of. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate to work on the first um, adaptive reuse of the only pre-Civil War building in University Circle. And we've owned the building since 2006 as an organization. And I've been working on it for six years, <laughs> raising, um, you know, the money to get here and building the partnerships to make sure the project's successful. So um, oftentimes, I feel like in this realm, you, you do have that long-term focus. It's important, I think, too, for, you know, finding those quick wins. There are things you can get done quick as a pilot, you know, small interventions that can build um, confidence, show little successes. But, um, you know, I, I feel like you're going to find it, it runs the gamut and you'll be served well by, um, you know, being a team player, being patient, um, being adaptable. Um, yeah, being willing to just figure it out. <laughs> as Joan, you shared before as well. Joan, I would like to start with you on a segue question here um, because it's, it comes from one of your mentees. So the question is, what advice do you have for taking planning ideas from the drawing board to reality? So sort of the next, but how do you pick projects, right? But then you've picked one, how do you go from idea to reality? Sure. Um, so I think, so I'm going to pitch this because I, again, I'm coming from more of a, I have a background in economic development and financing, um, but now work on the corporate side. I really think that you should look at projects that you think are going to be the most economically viable. Um, if you're kind of looking at your big hits or your quick wins. Um, so the, what's the project that you think, if, oh, if they did this, someone could make money from it? Um, again, it's going to depend on the neighborhood you're in, but if you're really looking to attract investment, which is frequently what we're doing in community and economic development, um, understanding that is, um, I think, the first way to start. So identify a project, really understand maybe what the funding stream could look like if someone developed the project in a certain way, and then going out and meeting with investors and developers one-on-one -on -one and pitching them the project is how I would really shape it. I'm going to let folks talk about more of those planning type pieces, um, but that how, how do you make sure there's the correct income stream is how I would tackle those projects. To add to that, Joan, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head though with it, because I think there's a balance um, in, in planning and design of, of thinking outside the box and, and being creative and pushing the envelope and, and also ensuring that the project is, is feasible, right? It, it can actually, from a financial standpoint, be implemented, right? Um, so if we go back to talking about wanting to do, you know, plans that actually get developed and don't sit on the shelf, you know, oftentimes the reason that some of those plans sit on the shelf is because, you know, the ideas, the concepts really weren't rooted in reality, right? They're, they're being crafted in, in maybe a, a fantasy world of hoping that something might happen or funding may come from here or there. So, um, you know, I think to my answer to that question would be uh, in, in a similar sense to Joan is like, yeah, as you're looking at a project, as you're, as you're planning a community, looking for ways and solution, design solutions that these projects can be implemented, understanding where funding, financing, how it can, how it can work, right, and how that all can kind of come together. Um, and I think both from having, and, and, and Elise and Jeff can probably talk to this um, just as well, uh, having now experience working on both the public and private sector, you know, one of the things I've taken with me in, in this position with OHM when we are working on plans is, you know, what are elements that, that a public, the public sector can work on? that maybe can help set up the private sector and vice versa. What are elements, what are projects that the private sector can come in um, that is gonna help support maybe some of the work that the public sector can do? Um, I think it's, 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 a, it's a clear reality in our world that you know, no one person can make something happen, right? There, there are those instances and those are great stories and I think all of us love to hear them, but the reality is it takes a collection of individuals, right? To, to make something happen. And so um, as you're, you know, taking those plans as you're taking those things, as the question said, from the drawing board to reality, it's, you know, what are the pieces and parts that can be done? It may not all get done. I think as Lisa, you're talking about in your example, it may not all get done in one fell swoop, right? It may be incremental in terms of how it is being uh, implemented, but how can it be done? And really being clear of that the ideas are set in, in some sort of reality while still trying to push the envelope um, all the same. I would add, 
that, and I completely agree with Arthur and Joan, but I would add that um, get, get the pitch perfect and also get good asking for things because that's, you're going to be, if, if you believe in this project, you're going to be talking to a lot of people about it. And a lot of those conversations may go nowhere, but it all, all it takes is one conversation for you to find the right person who opens the door to a world of opportunity for you. Um, so those are the two things that I would add. Also really quick to add, Jeff, with, as you were talking, it, it reminded me to also making sure that as you're projects, they are rooted uh, within the community as well, right? Because they can be just as, uh, as, a, as much of an advocate for it and making sure that it comes to fruition as, as anything else, right? So it goes back to, you know, understanding who the stakeholders are, understanding the community, understanding the situation, and really making sure that everyone's rallying behind it. Because um, if you have everybody rallying behind it, uh, or the majority of individuals rallying behind it, it makes kind of that incremental uh, implementation of those initiatives uh, a little bit easier, right? Because it's, it's some, you know, you're not worried about, okay, now um, we have to, you know, go back out to the community and, and re-explain or try to galvanize the community again because we're changing stuff so much, right? So if you have that, it kind of just helps the pieces fall into place. Funders request that too, evidence of community inv involvement, whether that's like a master plan, whether it's a sign-in sheet from a public meeting that you had, um, that's a, a, critical, a critical component of uh, raising money for affordable housing or economic development to be able to demonstrate that you have the support of the community. I think that element is all over planning, even things like putting a changing your driveway, for instance, a, a very famous Clevelander recently wanted to completely reshape his driveway. When it came before the City Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals, the most the large part of the conversation was the neighbor next door and would this impact them and what did it mean for tree health even something small it's one household it's one parcel in a community you still have neighbors that this might impact that is still always part of urban planning and what you're all saying about rarely are these things single actor projects you have all these different perspectives so check your ego at the door and you have all these people and it's in incremental and it sometimes takes years is what makes planning stories so good. They go in a direction you don't anticipate or they involve personalities or incredible learning curves or you don't know what, just all these different things. And I think the, the passion we all have for urban places, it's just so cool to get to be one of the people in those stories as these things happen. Um, I, love, I love hearing your answers to this. I want to take one question from the Q&A, and it's probably going to be the end of our time here. We have students trying to get to 6 p.m. classes tonight, and I know they're going to want to grab some dinner ahead of time. So uh, we have a question from a student in the Q&A. So how do you develop strategic thinking? Is it different from creative or critical thinking? So I will leave this open to whoever would like to jump in. I'll, I'll I'll jump in the jump in the deep end of the pool for that one. I I don't, to me I feel like it's it's a little bit all of the same, right? I mean, um, I feel like thinking creatively, thinking is thinking strategically, um, and it's thinking critically. I think you kind of have to do all of it at the same time. I think it goes back to the conversation uh, that we were just having. You know, um, as Joni, you were bringing up like, you know, how are we doing projects that that are set in the market reality, right? Understanding the costs associated with the project, understanding if it's a development project that that developer is going to be looking for for profit, right? Um, I mean, we'd be kidding ourselves if any developer is looking to develop something just for the sake of developing it, right? I mean, that's again setting ourselves within the reality. So I, I think developing that strategic kind of creative and critical thinking comes a little bit with um, experience. Um, it comes a little bit with um, just understanding the different mechanisms um, that are available. Um, so I definitely think it's a, it's a skill that you can learn, um, but I also think it's a skill that's also obtained through, through experience and through going through a situation. Um, I, you know, I can think back to a couple different situations where you know, a, a project headed in one direction and then it flipped. And then thinking back to myself, like coming out of a meeting going like, what just happened? 
You know what I mean? Like I, I was physically there and I was absorbing everything, but I left going like, I don't know what we're doing next. I, I, I distinctly remember one project meeting, walking out with one of my colleagues and we both looked at each other and we said, I don't know what just happened and I don't know what we're supposed to do next. Right? Like it's, it's those kinds of, um, I think it's those kinds of experiences that, that you'll gain. Um, it's those kinds of experiences that you can gain through conversations with, with your mentors, with other individuals, right? With other colleagues to, to understand what they went through. Um, and then, you know, thinking to yourself, okay, well then how could I apply that to maybe my situation? Um, so I, I think that strategic thinking, creative, uh, critical thinking, I don't, to me, it kind of all uh, gels together uh, as one, because I think you need a little bit of everything uh, when you're approaching uh, certain projects. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, you know, I think a really, there's a couple of important components of developing this in yourself, because I agree with Arthur, you know, it's an evolving, an ever evolving process. Um, one of those is, again, the importance of those, those networks, those professional networks, so that you have colleagues that might have a different expertise that you do, a different experience than you do. To kind of talk through projects with them what what factors might you not be thinking of you know what what might exist that's you know not currently on your radar that you really need to be thinking about and then as that project moves forward that's something you're going to pay attention to uh, moving forward i think the other really important thing which again is an ever evolving process is getting to know yourself what are your like kind of automatic assumptions and blind spots are you someone that likes to just see the bigger picture and ignore the details or get really really deep into the details and not quite see the bigger picture so you're you're prompting yourself to make sure that you know you're you're considering this from from all angles and i think you know if you do have that hard skill that you develop whether that be um you know really understanding financial models um you know in our realm being a a civil engineer understanding construction that's just another strength to you that you're really going to bring to that table when you're considering and thinking through things um so i think it, it's you know it's all encompassing and, and there's a lot of different ways that you can um develop it and and just to quickly add uh, to what elise said i think you know one of the things that i've i've been really fortunate working uh at ohm because we also do um engineering and other different services is there are times that i will go over to our other disciplines and sections and and talk about certain projects and and just get their two cents right so i think perspective is like the i i say to this day that i'm always trying to gain perspective because i don't think you can never have enough perspective in life um because you just don't you, things are seen in different ways so to elisa's point you know, I'll go to other colleagues who are not in my profession and and talk through a project and just curious of what you have to say, right? Um, I do, um, I, I uh, review some of my presentations um, uh, sometimes with like my wife who, who's a nurse. And to me, I'm like, well, you know, um, if, if she understands what I'm, I'm presenting since she's not familiar with it, it's not something she does every day, right? Because when you review sometimes presentations, you do it with a colleague who does this every day and can fill in the gaps, right? Um, you know, if, if she's following along with my presentation, then I feel more confident going into a public meeting um, and presenting that information, uh, right? Because you're presenting to individuals who are not necessarily in your field. So I think any opportunity you can to go out and just get that different perspective and just test it out with someone else, to Lisa's point, is really going to help you build and get a different viewpoint, right? So just as important as it to get people people's opinions within your own field, I think it's just as important sometimes to get a, a quote unquote like outsider's perspective, right? I'm gonna step out of my role as moderator here for just a second if I can cheat. Um, to say that part of it is also personality driven, I think. So if you look at the Myers-Briggs personality types, which are criticized, of course, by psychologists, but um, there are personality types that are kind of hardwired to have a strategic view of the world to have a skill set for identifying big picture objectives and strategy to support it. But, and I have heard, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that urban planners disproportionately test into those personality types, which sort of doesn't surprise me. But I think other personality types are equally helpful in the planning arena. We need the creative energy. We need the different perspectives to make things work. Um, any closing comments from our panelists before I feed the floor to Rob? Anyone? Yeah, the only thing I'll the only thing I'll add, Dr. Ginning, is uh, to uh, the uh, mentees. Just, just don't be afraid to uh, ask questions of your mentors, and and also don't be afraid to ask questions uh, of other individuals that that you look up to. 
um, or uh, that, you know, um, that are in a field or in a position that you're interested in, you know, go out and ask those questions uh, to those individuals. Um, so I would just encourage people not to, um, not to uh, be worried to go up to them or feel awkward. Just, just I, I promise you nine times out of 10 that those individuals are going to be receptive to that and open to, to hearing out your questions and offering uh, any uh, advice or uh, comments uh, that you're asking for. Absolutely. And Levin rolls deep. So this is a network that mentees should and can uh, lean on and ask questions of. Absolutely. I would say be creative with your mentoring experience. Uh, it's um, Margaret, shout out to Margaret, who's totally awesome, but she and I have been sort of preparing for the year and we've talked about mock interviews. We've talked about like the, the connections, just kind of chatting um, about professional stuff and also like fine tuning her resume a little bit. So just be creative. Last summer we had a really nice uh, group um, my mentee, Nora Walsh, worked with me to develop like a group uh, to have development. Um, people who work in real estate development come and talk to a group of about 10 students who are really interested in that. So that was a lot of, lot of fun. So maximize the experience, make it fun, be creative with it. Thank you for those wise words. And thank you again all so much for being part of this tonight. I've enjoyed this time with you. Um, director, I see the floor. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say, um, I wrote a bunch, a whole bunch of notes, and I got more of them. I got like notes everywhere. Uh, I don't want to go through because we have to get on to class, but um, we just finished up Thanksgiving, right? And I ate a bunch of turkey and pies and too much, but I am so thankful that you are part of our family, that you are part of our team. On, and on behalf of the college, uh, Dr. Gating, I want to say thanks to you, but I just thank you for everything you've sh have shared with us today. And your willingness to share with our students uh, as the year unfolds. And we could not do this program without the, the mentors, obviously. That's what the program is all about. But just your passion, your willingness to commit the time and investment is just invaluable. And on behalf of our students, I want to say thank you. Um, on to everybody to be safe as you venture out with this weather. And uh, as we go into the holiday season, um, you know, over the next month or so, um, just think about what you do have in our life, even though we're dealing with this COVID thing. There is a lot of things to be thankful for, and the people on the screen are part of that process. So thank you for being part of our team. Thanks, for everyone, for showing up today, and good luck, and have a safe and great evening. Thanks a lot, and really appreciate your time today. Take care, everyone.